Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to a brand new episode of Take Flight Podcast, episode 230. It's crazy that we are approaching almost, uh, in a few episodes, episode 250. So yeah, we, we keep moving forward. And we are, of course, back with your four hosts, Daniel Johnson, Olu Okanola, Pabilo Timbo, and I, Shul Ahmed. From the title, we are back with another very exciting Take Flight Talks interview episode, where we interview thought leaders and trailblazers, sharing with us their journey and expertise on how they've been able to take flight in their respective arena. Now, in case you've missed any of our previous Take Flight Talks interview episodes, I mean, where have you been? Make sure to check them out. We've interviewed leaders from various industries, from healthcare to nonprofits, real estate to the music industry, angel investing to founders of venture capital firms. The list is growing, so please make sure to check them out if you haven't done so already. Now, back to today's episode, we are interviewing a multi-hyphenated leader with a proven international track record across a wide variety of industries. This week's distinguished guest is Frederick Simos, who is a global leader, CFO, and professor. Now, Fred is an extremely externally focused business and finance leader with a passion for technology and talent development. With more than 25 years experience building up new organizations, driving growth as a PL owner, and delivering business and digital transformation in high performing companies across industrial, financial services, shared services, and healthcare sectors. We are so excited about today's conversation. After almost 18 years in the pharma sector, he recently joined Cargill, which is an American agribusiness and is one of the largest privately held companies in the world and he recently joined in a global leader role. Now on top of all of that Fred is somehow also a professor at a business school in Madrid where he teaches finance for digital startups and projects in the digital business and innovation masters. Now this episode is a great one for us personally as Fred has been an inspiring leader that Pabilo and I met very early on in our careers and over the years has been a great mentor for us providing impactful advice over the years to us and to many other next generation leaders. Now in today's episode we'll be diving deep into Fred's journey from his younger years to becoming the international leader that he is today, his why during his career, as well as that tips and recommendations for all you flyers out there looking to take flight. Now let's get started with another amazing interview episode in hit the music. Take off, take flight with you. We never fly, but we're flying. Right, Fred, welcome to Take Flight Podcast. We are all very excited to have you on. But firstly, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Joel. I'm super excited to uh, to be with you today on the Take Flight Podcast. I just can't believe that it took you more than 200 episodes to invite me. Apart from that, <laughs> everything is great. <laughs> I know, you know, we had to we had to invite the big dogs a lot later on, Fred. So, you know, we had to, it, takes a, it takes a bit of time. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I get that, I get that. <laughs> but it's great to be here, jokes apart. Yeah, no, and uh, I'm going to take you back pretty, uh, uh, really back. Um, I think I was uh, raised mostly in France. Uh, um, I'm half French, half Portuguese. Um, but we moved there and my father is an immigrant, uh, set up his own uh, business. Uh, it was in the construction business. And, and for him, watching him run that business and the way he behaved really influenced, uh, influenced me uh, throughout my, my career. And um, I actually have memories uh, from going back um, when I was about nine years old, going to the office with him on Saturdays and watching him uh, pitch to customers and sell simply on the basis of the the expertise that he was sharing and the advice he was sharing with customers. I found it amazing. And uh, that created the the respect I have today for uh, our uh, first line uh, people. So on the commercial side or on the medical side when I was in the healthcare business. So that respect for customer facing roles, I definitely uh, got from that. I think um, I also learned from him um, that despite uh, putting your best effort, uh, success isn't the norm in uh, in this field. Um, he actually had pretty uh, difficult years. Uh, one where he had to uh, to shut down his uh, business as a result of a customer uh, not paying him during uh, one of these recessions, and and for me it was. Um, 
a, uh, uh, obviously uh, surprising uh, as a teenager, uh, seeing your father back at home, he was working from the, the living room table. And um, I remember at the time, a lot of people were coming to our place. Um, so ex-employees, uh, customers, uh, vendors, uh, subcontractors. And I, I remember having a conversation with him at the time uh, to say, hey, I, I never realized that uh, while running your business, you were impacting so many people out there. And, and the word wasn't uh, uh, as used as it is today, but I think in a way I was describing the ecosystem that you build around a company when, uh, when you run that. So I think that influenced me a lot in, in terms of my understanding of what business is and how it fits into a, a broader uh, ecosystem together with the learning of, uh, of yeah, your success is not uh, something that you, you should take for granted. Um, and, and actually back on that story, I think the, the one thing that I do remember from, from that conversation with him about the impact on the broader uh, world out there was that uh, a few years later, actually, he reminded me about that conversation. And he said, hey, uh, when I was like down and I was looking for the reason to start my business again, and today is uh, still not retired, still running that business. He reminded me of this that, that conversation, uh, saying that it was the, the one thing that made him find the courage to restart again. And so that was the, the, the next learning for me uh, um, during my, my uh, younger years, um, that you also, you don't have to be a, a, a person of, of influence to, uh, to influence people around you. And as a kid, you can influence a, a father that is going through difficult times. So I think these are kind of defining moments for me in, in how I perceive business and how I've tried to act um, throughout. And um, yeah, I think it was no surprise uh, when uh, I had to decide what to do uh, and what to study. I decided to go for business school and, and so really no, no surprise at all. I, I studied business school in, uh, in Bordeaux, France, and then finished in, uh, in Icade in, uh, in Madrid. That's kind of my journey uh, through the, the teenage years, I'd say. Thank, thank you, Fred. And I think that's a great segue for the question I have. Um, I would say I'm a proficient and fluent speaker in French and Portuguese, but unfortunately I'm not. I said, <laughs> we, could, I said we could continue in, uh, in Portuguese or, from, or Francais, but we'll, we'll continue in English. Um, but no, Fred, thank you for giving that context into your early years. And I think one thing you, you said about how you influenced your dad is and I think it works two ways is you're never too old to learn and, and you're never too young to teach. Mm -hmm. But um, I like that kind of post graduation from Bordeaux and business school. How has your journey been past or post graduation and in your professional career becoming the false multifaceted leader that you are today? What would be the mm -hmm. key points you would you would highlight? So during business school, I specialized in finance, but I was still having tons of doubts about where to go, where in finance, uh, what industry and so on. And I felt actually the one thing that, that uh, I had in me is that I wanted to continue exploring. And so I solely focused on companies that were providing uh, uh, rotational programs uh, that would allow me to uh, test different fields in the, in the company, different industries and so on. And I ended up um, uh, joining uh, General Electric on their financial management program um, in, uh, in Spain at the time. And um, that rotational program actually put me on an international uh, career path because basically for two years and a half, I was every six months going to a different division, different country, different role. At the same time, I was we were having uh, um, classroom uh, learning uh, uh, experience. So for me, it was kind of part of continuing my my education, uh, continuing growing. So that was my my focus when I came out of, of business school. I was super happy. I found that uh, that opportunity. Um, also, I think this uh, this start where you have to change every six months kind of uh, helped me um, develop that skill and be able to adapt very quickly to new environments, uh, and even try to make an impact in very short periods of time, which, uh, is kind of, uh, of difficult. Um, and I think, uh, after that, the, the rotational program, I actually joined, um, one of the divisions because one of the managers that I'd worked with for, uh, during that period of time, um, 
called me one day and said, hey, uh, Fred, I have uh, this great role for you. Would you want to become a uh, European treasurer for the G lighting division in, uh, in Kingston in London? And um, the first thing that came through my mind is, uh, is I asked him is, have you lost your mind? Uh, because I was, I was 25 years old at the time. But for me, it was one of the best learnings uh, and the best advice that I've received uh, throughout my career is despite my own doubts about my ability to do the role, I had a leader that put his trust in me and said, hey, I think you can do this. Hey. And even if you can't, <laughs> I'll be there to help you. Right. And I think that's something that I've tried to replicate throughout my uh, my career myself. Um, and um, yeah, something that uh, I will I will retain for forever. So I had a good run at uh, a GE, landed in a, in a finance head role for finance head role for a, uh, a cluster of countries. Um, but after nine years uh, there, I started to uh, think about uh, whether I wanted to be my whole career uh, at GE. The group was large enough at the time to uh, to uh, experience multiple divisions and multiple roles. So, uh, but I felt I was missing something, um, and it was a, a broader purpose. And I was actually attracted. That's when I was attracted to the healthcare sector. So I joined uh, Novartis, the, uh, the the pharma company, um, um, in a, in a finance role. And at uh, Novartis, I spent half of my career uh, in finance and the other half in more business roles. Um, I had the country GM since. I had uh, experiences building up a shared services organization in commercial and medical, and then in the more transactional back office. Um, and uh, my last uh, role in finance was uh, global CFO for our customer and technology solutions division. And um, then on the on the business side, I think my last role was uh, the global business lead for the largest ever transformation that we launched, uh, business and digital transformation that we launched. Um, and so um, great um, great experience at uh, at Novartis, had tons of of opportunities. Uh, but as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, after uh, 18 years, I actually uh, uh, moved on and joined uh, Cargill now in a completely different sector in a, in a global process and transformation lead role. So it's kind of long story. It takes me more and more time to explain my story as I, as I age, <laughs> but that's, uh, that's, a, that's a brief summary. You mentioned, right, you moved from GE to Novartis and during your role, you went from multiple different roles. But if you go back to your early days and the first mm -hmm. time you became a CFO, how was that role? How was that transition? How did you, how have you seen that evolve over the years to your current role now from mm -hmm. your early days as a CFO? Why don't you talk yeah. through that? And I have to say that uh, CFO is probably one of the roles that I've enjoyed the uh, most. Um, I think there are still today great roles, but basically at GE, I had, uh, as I said, finance head roles. They didn't have the full scope. And at Novartis, I had my uh, uh, first broad CFO role uh, in Belgium, right after maybe a couple of years after starting at, at Novartis. I was in Belgium at the time. And suddenly I became responsible for things I had no clue about. <laughs> so I, I was responsible for IT, logistics, procurement. I mean, all right. and uh, usually with people that were very, very uh, experienced in their, in their, in their roles and uh, yeah, here, here I was, a young guy uh, landing in Belgium, uh, becoming the uh, the CFO for the for the country, and so um, at the time I would say um, good CFOs were CFOs that had a, a COO profile, so they were running operations, right, mm -hmm. um, and they were keeping taking care of uh, of the inside of the house while the CEO was uh, out there outside. I think. That's uh, that's how I would define the, the successful CFO uh, back then when I when I started. Um, but if I if I think about again my my own experiences and what I told you about the beginning about my experience, I've I've always been attracted to the outside, and so the uh, the external focus was always something that was uh, I always wanted to understand what's behind that sales number, right? Uh, who are our customers and what's driving their business and how can we grow with them and so on. And so I had that curiosity that allowed me to make the transition to how the CFO role has evolved over the last few years, where it went to more of a, um, an externally focused uh, role and also one more uh, focused on um, 
adoption of, uh, of uh, new technologies, transformation, and you see successful CFOs now have, have completely changed their, their, their profile. So it's more about the business acumen, the transformation, the technology, and you're first and foremost, you need to be a business leader and finance is just a skill you bring to the table. It doesn't, does no longer define you, right? And so I think that's how I see the, the function um, uh, uh, changing. Um, in terms of uh, the experience, my first time CFO role, I think some of the things that were difficult for me is, is one, you become the functional leader in a country, for example. Uh, so you, you're like the, the last person in the function that needs to uh, have all the answers. At least that's what you believe when you get in the role. Um, you now need to start influencing uh, a leadership team of people with multiple backgrounds and, and, uh, and functions and so on that usually you don't know much about uh, when you start. So I think that was the, uh, the difficult part. It was kind of a lonely role I felt at the beginning. And, and you mentioned, I think I, I went into teaching later on in my career. I think that first CFO role and an experience that if you give me a minute to explain is uh, I have an anecdote that led to me being interested in, in teaching, which is um, maybe first uh, few weeks in the role, I was uh, after a long day of meetings, I get back into my office, I sit down. And on my desk, there's a pile of papers with a post-it from one of our uh, business leaders that says, hey, Fred, can you please sign this? Um, business as usual. So I look, <laughs> strange post-it, strange <laughs> message. I look at the thing and I start asking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, red flag. And I start work, look, look, asking around. And basically what it was, it was uh, a consignment stock um, uh, contract to sell to one of the uh, cell treatments to an hospital but not invoice them until they consume uh, from the stock at the hospital. And so there was nothing conventional uh, business as usual in that, uh, in that contract. And, and again, asking around, I figured out that what happened is that the uh, franchise had reached his target number and we were close to year end and they were trying to defer sales from one year to another so that yeah. uh, the bonus with the, which was capped because they had already exceeded the, this year's number, um, uh, so that the sales would benefit their target for the following year. And so at that point in time, actually, I decided to pick up the phone and I called the regional CFO and I said, uh, hey, um, I have this happening. And um, I started to call other people and, and say, okay, what should I do? I obviously didn't sign the contract. But then in my one-on-one -on -one with my boss at the time, uh, back then, I said, hey, we can't let people go into these roles as first-time CFOs and not have a support network and not be uh, trained on this. And so at that point in time, I started a first time CFO training with four or five CFO ah. colleagues that uh, I had reached out. And so the whole history of that CFO training comes from that experience. I see. And sharing the, the challenges of, uh, of me uh, in my first uh, time CFO role. It's great. Ah. That it's, that's an amazing story, Fred, because um, two years old, coming up to two years now, I've started my first role as a CFO. And mm -hmm. like you've just mentioned the story there, it's like you're thrown in the deep end and you don't have that support network of, okay, how do you handle these different um, interactions? Especially because I say to my team all the time that CFO is a very interesting role because quote unquote, you don't own anything operationally, but you own everything mm -hmm. because anything that yeah. goes to you or goes through the operation has a bottom line, a PL impact. They always ask him for advice. Should we do this? Should we do that? But it's great that that first experience made you see, okay, I wish when I was a CFO, I had this support, this learning, these trainings, and you ended up going on to build it because not many people actually go back and say, okay, this is a gap yeah. and actually de develop it. So that's amazing, I must say. Yeah, no, thanks. And I think you describe one thing that, is, that, that describes why I love the CFO role is how you connect all of the different parts and you bring that into the financials, but not only, right? I mean, I think that connection that CFOs are able to make are 
are great. And this is why I love that role. So Fred, that gives us a nice segue to the next stage of your career, because I think just from you explaining the, the transition first time becoming a CFO and everything, I think we can all definitely sense that this is a role that you've loved to do and you've enjoyed. But I think also from mm -hmm. your responses, we definitely sense a curiosity that you have within you and also that business exploration almost that you have as well. So it'd be great to understand when you transition outside of a finance role into more of a global business leader and creating businesses and service lines within these large existing businesses, but also some of the smaller businesses as well. Um, how, how has that experience mm -hmm. been of that transitioning outside of finance? And where do you sit today in terms of the different roles that you've seen and the experiences you've, you've taken away from that? So because of the way I was uh, uh, approaching the CFO role, I very early, even when I was at uh, GE, I had the opportunities to move to the business side. At the time at GE, I didn't make the, the step because I don't think it was the, the right time. Um, and actually what led me to, uh, to move to the business side was uh, a number of experience that I had through my career. So as I said, I think I was a CFO that was always involved in, in transformation. Um, and I had the opportunity to, uh, to lead uh, large business services uh, set up in commercial and medical, for example, as I, as I mentioned. I was always interested in, in, in technology. So um, I was curious about maybe because I was a bit lazy in the, in the potential of, of technology to simplify things for, for people and be more, more impactful. And so I was part, for example, of the team that set up our, our digital hub uh, uh, in Spain. Um, way before AI was as fancy as it is uh, today. And um, I also had experiences on the people side that made me believe I could do it. Um, so for example, I had an ad interim general management experience in, uh, in Spain for um, uh, uh, quite a long period in the end. And I realized, oh my God, I can influence 3000 people. <laughs> Right. Uh, I think the scale at which I was uh, working suddenly opened up and that's what attracted me to say now is the right time. I've had these experiences. Uh, I know as business leaders, we need to think about these things. We need to think about transformation. We need to think about how do we leverage technology and we need to bring people along. And these are things that I was able to experience through my, throughout my career. And I said, now is the right time for me to make that, uh, that shift. And so um, again, I say my CFO experiences uh, helped me uh, make that uh, made that transition. I think on the challenging side of things, also when I moved, um, you need to spend a lot of time uh, building your support network, similar to the experience I described for for CFO, mm -hmm. uh, because there's a lot of credibility building and trust that you need to establish at the start. I mean, initially people see you as, hey, he's the finance guy that moved to, uh, to business, right? You're not the, the business guy. And so before you overcome that, I think you need a lot of, uh, of advice. You need to consider different, a lot of different angles. You know, to recognize that in the end, you're not the, uh, the expert. And, and in the end, it's about people leadership. And so that's something that I was able to experience before and, and, and uh, uh, gave me confidence that I could, uh, I could do it. And in terms of the opportunity for people to move from from CFO to this role. I think you have great foundations. I mean, I know no CEO that is no good CFO, right? Mm. All of the good CEOs, they need to know their numbers, right? And so you already have that super strong base. Um, and to me, um, yeah, I think CFOs are well positioned to make that uh, that transition. And uh, you it gives you the opportunity to have a much broader impact than through a functional leadership role. So, in a, in a nutshell, yeah. what, uh... amazing. Yeah. Thank you, Fred. And I think that's a, that's a great promotion actually for, for all, for all our listeners actually, because we have listeners from a wide variety of different ages, but whether you're early in your career or looking at a CFO role potentially later on, or even a broader career, as Fred has laid out from his own journey, the first role you do, the first company you do is not necessarily the one that you're going to be at forever. And actually, mm. as long as you keep pushing through growing and developing as Fred clearly has, then the doors actually naturally open for you later on and even more and bigger opportunities do, do come by. So it's definitely something for our listeners to to consider and fred's a great testament of that it's it's a great uh add-on i'm sure because i never had a plan i mean it wasn't mm -hmm. it was never the plan right? interesting uh, i didn't have like a career path i i was i had a, a filter by which i was assessing whether the, the next opportunity was right and what i could bring to the role and what i was going to get in terms of learning and growth 
uh, but I never had like a, a, a clear path from the beginning. Fred, I'm on audio. You just have to excuse me. I can see you guys, but you can't see me. Um, mm -hmm. So I'll go into the next question. So Fred, at the start of 2023, you decided to then, with everything that you've done in your career, become a professor at the mm -hmm. IE Business School based in um, <laughs> uh, Madrid. I think, I think yeah. perhaps the general why is quite clear, but maybe you could share a little bit of your experience as to why you decided to take that step. And what was your mm -hmm. why behind wanting to be a professor and give back to the students? We have a lot of entrepreneurs that are listening to our uh, podcast, so it'd be good to get our perspectives there. Yeah, so on the light side, I think uh, you all know that we learn from failure, and so I had tons of them. And so for me, I, I felt I was really, really prepared to, uh, to become a professor. Uh, because you learn more from failures and from successes. But um, I, I told you how I got into, into teaching. So I, I, I got involved into the, the Internal Finance Academy, um, and I really, really enjoyed that. And, and so when I left Novartis at the end of, uh, of 20, uh, 23, of 22, sorry, I, I looked back and I said, okay, what are the things that I absolutely want to keep in my life? And one of them was uh, teaching and sharing these experiences and the exchanges with, uh, with, uh, with people and so on. And so I decided to, uh, to become an adjunct professor at uh, IA Business School. Uh, I totally underestimated the, the prep time uh, to prepare a syllabus, to get that approved, to prepare the, how you're gonna facilitate the class and so on, because it's one thing to do it for let's say colleagues internally and share your experiences and so on. It's something else to do it in the context of a, yeah. of a master and a, and a, and a big program. Um, but I think in terms of, um, you know, as they, they say that there is no better way to learn than, than by teaching. Right. And I think for me, um, the, I really enjoy the, the research part, right. And, and how I'm going to look at, uh, facilitating the class and the questioning, right. Um, for me, all of the great leaders are the leaders that know to, uh, how to ask the right question at the right time, not necessarily uh, having all of the answers, right? And as you, as you normally think at the beginning of, of your career. So um, I, apart from yeah, giving back and sharing, um, I always feel that every class is different, even though I, I might, I was giving back-to-back -back classes to, uh, to, with the same topic to two different classes. The two classes would always be different just mm. because of the different type of interactions, the different type of questions and how you adapt to that. And, and again, I think apart from the giving back, I think the makes you stronger in how you prepare the, it keeps you curious about how things are evolving out there. You need to stay current and then how you facilitate, how you ask questions allows you to become a better coach, a better mentor, a better leader in my view. Mm. Uh, Fred, Fred, you mentioned a few words there like mentorship um also i can imagine these students might have a lot of questions for you and i think in a very <laughs> in an ever-changing landscape of career opportunities even earlier you mentioned about ai mm -hmm. and career opportunities being very very varied this these this day and age we mentor a number of people individually and support um individuals whether it's through this podcast or through our internal or external networks or even family yeah. members and friends and i'm sure you may have this recurring question that we always get and it's, what career should I go into? And mm -hmm. it's sort of a question that's hidden because it's a question of where, what career should I go into to get paid more? Or what should I, or we often <laughs> think, go into this career because you get paid more or go into this yeah. career because you have the passion. But sometimes you have to understand, mm -hmm. oh, I might want to be a footballer, but I have to accept that I'm not going to be a great footballer. So how would you answer that question today when your students or anyone comes to you and say, what career should I go into? Because mm -hmm. you've had a, a good, great experience in your both professional career and also now in academia. So keen mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts on that. So I think with the, uh, the footballer example, you nailed it because I think the number one thing is self-awareness. And um, actually, and I see that in younger generations, there's a lot more self-awareness now in people that take more time to reflect, connect, learn about themselves and about the opportunities than I was doing at, my, uh, at their age. Uh, and that's something I admire in younger generations and in you guys. Um, but I think it's always, always a difficult co uh, question because it's very personal because of that, because it needs to come from the inside. It's your, to me, your motivation. If you want to be successful uh, and if you want to get paid more, you need to be in a field where um, 
Yeah. Every time you go to the office in the morning or go to work, you have a bounce in your step and you have that uh, energy and you need, you're in a field that gives you energy rather than sucks energy out of you, right? And and you work with people that give you energy, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think when I get that question in a, in a mentorship relation, I always try to help people realize that um, and explore what is important to them um, and what they uh, can bring to the to the role uh, that they're or the the roles that they're exploring. And maybe on the personal side, I had to go through that question myself very recently when I moved to Cargill, right? Super fresh. Um, and so first, I looked at uh, if I, I do an analogy to how you do strategy at a company, I say, where do I want to play? Right. And I, I looked on, I worked on something called uh, degrees of fit. So you basically rate on a yes, no, maybe uh, a quadrant where you have um, what industry you could work in, what type of roles you could do, um, what geography do you want to do that in and what type of company. So you want to do like uh, startups versus a large company, growth company, innovation company and so on. And so I did that uh, up front and that really, really helped me to, to be more targeted about my uh, search and, and, and explore, okay, what, what are the, the areas where I would feel comfortable and happy to, uh, to work in. And then um, when opportunities started to firm up, I think I, I had, uh, again, before I even evaluated whether I could, I would participate in a interview process, for example, I had very clear the three, four things that would be important for me uh, when deciding. So for me, it was, um, does the company have a, a strong purpose that I can relate to? Um, Cargill Tech. Uh, what is the, the culture of the of the company? Um, and for me, Cargill attracted me because of its uh, people first uh, uh, culture. Mm. Um, then how diverse uh, is the team? Um, and so as, as an example, one of the questions I asked during one of the interviews was, hey, tell me about the diversity of the company. And one HRBP gave me a super example. She said, I went to the uh, onboarding day and there were people from all generations. Right? And I was like, great. That's what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and, and finally, I think one thing that was important to me, maybe because of the pharma and the technology side of things, is, is it an innovative company? Right. And so long story short, I, I did a lot of reflection before uh, about where do I want to play and then uh, trying to match with the skills I was bringing to, uh, to that field. And then um, I had a, a clear filter about which I was going to make my decisions. I tell you, I said no to things where at some point I'm like, Fred, you're nuts. <laughs> and, and people around me were like, Fred, what are you doing? Uh, but, but it's because my compass was super clear. Yeah, and important. Mm. I, I, I tell you, uh, maybe 10 years back, I wouldn't have been as clear. And what I try to do with uh, mentees and also people in, in classes is, is kind of share these things so that they can stop thinking about it much earlier. Because I wish somebody had told me, basically, as simple as that. Yeah, Fred, when you did that quadrant, um, I think I think I might know the answer. But do you think it's important to share that with people that you trust or people that can give you sort of sound counsel and advice? Or is it something yeah, you just internalize uh, and just do it? Yeah. Um, and in particular, because... Um, so I was always very externally focused, so I had a good network. Um, but it, as you start in your career, maybe you don't have such a network to be able to do that assessment well. So I think talking to other people, um, mentors you trust, um, you would find it amazing. But reaching out to, even to people in a certain industry to learn about the industry, just reach it out on LinkedIn and so on, you would be amazed at the response mm -hmm. rate right, of people that say yes to uh, younger generations just to help a little, right? They say, hey, I'm trying to learn about this industry and so on. So I always encourage people to, yeah, share it and get perspective from, from people that have worked in the industries that you're considering or the roles that you're considering and so on. Ex expect a lot of messages uh, on LinkedIn after this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we, can, we, uh, can we edit the interview? Maybe? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do. I, I, I get a lot already. And, and so I filter commercial, but I respond to all of these, these asks. Great. That's um, nice. That's nice. Mm.
So maybe Fred, uh, with that in mind, let's try and manage your LinkedIn uh, inbox with the next question a little bit. So we'll try and give as much value as we can with the with the episode. Um, because I think that with the experience that you've had with, with GE, which maybe some of our, our listeners may not be aware, but back in the period when Fred was working for GE, it was one of the largest companies in the globe and it was spread across various industries. And actually the business was booming. It was only later yeah. on when o Olu was working for them. That's when the business <laughs> seemed to decline. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Fred. I'm going to say, I'm say, I'm gonna say the same comment. thing. I'm going to say the same thing. Yeah, I like that. I like that line. <laughs> no no, comment. I, had to, I had to put it in there. We're, 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 we're obviously joking. Olu is one of the best uh, next generation CFOs ever. But the point I was trying to make is GE was a, a, a large uh, conglomerate, very big size across multiple industries then healthcare novartis very large company then of course um Kage, which is one of the largest privately run businesses as well and even within those elements um fred you've definitely brought an entrepreneurial view of building businesses within those sectors as well so yeah. if you had to explain for the next generation of okay if the question is fred should i go into the startup land or should i go into a large corporate or should i go into a private run business what would be your kind of guiding questions for people who are maybe considering that? So, uh, yeah, that's a super good question, actually. Um, I think, again, I would try to understand uh, what's driving uh, uh, people and uh, what type of, uh, of framework they, they need around them. Because I think, obviously, um, uh, all of my family um, is running their own businesses. I've, I've been surrounded by entrepreneurs. I even married one. Right, but I never went into I never went into entrepreneurship myself, but I always took uh, my corporate roles with an entrepreneurship mindset. Um, and um, I think for people considering the the different companies, I think it's more about the environment that you want to work in, the type of in infrastructure that you want around you, because it's very convenient to look for international opportunities uh, once you're part of a, a very big group. And so for me, that was important when I started my career as part of my learning. And so that's why I was uh, I chose that. So I think I, I try to understand also the appetite for risk um, mm -hmm. that uh, people have. Um, the and, and again, saying that um, no doors are ever closed um, mm. and you learn from both sides, right? Um, I think uh, when I see now, in particular in the healthcare industry, but I was also surprised to see what I found at Cargill, the, the collaboration between uh, big corporations and startups uh, in all of the fields is just impressive. And so actually knowing both sides is a, is a great uh, uh, skill to, uh, to and capability to, uh, to have. And, and so I would say it's just... Uh, um, yeah, look for for the opportunities and and what initially attracts you, but never no door is ever closed to uh, to move to the uh, to the other side at some point in time in in your career. Um, and I've actually also been uh, supporting some uh, healthcare startups uh, in that space, trying to help them uh, better position themselves to collaborate with uh, with large multinationals. So I think I've always tried to still understand both. Uh, uh, smaller organizations and bigger ones but um, it's kind of yeah the way i see it uh, fred okay. incredible insights um I'm, I'm just sitting here taking notes as as we're having a conversation I, i'm extremely curious to understand knowing you um thinking about the conversations that we've had over the years and today's conversation mm -hmm. and your decorated career as we've mentioned before what would you have done differently um throughout your career and if there is something you would have done differently and if so why i think uh, there's a, I spent 18 years at, uh, at Novartis, right? Um, and I was given great opportunities to, uh, to move around and so on. But I think at one point in time, I probably got too comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish I had, not that I think I would be in a different place than I am today. I'm like, I'm just super ecstatic about sure. uh, my career and what I've achieved and so on. But I wish that some point in time throughout my uh, my career in Novartis, I would have actually uh, stretched myself to do something different faster. And, mm -hmm. and again, I've been changing roles every two to three years, yes. going to different fields and so on. So it's not like I was getting bored. It's true. <laughs> um, and it's probably what kept me kept me there so long. But um, yeah, I think comfort is the opposite of, of uh, learning zone and progress and, yep. and yeah and progress and i think 
uh, at some point in time, I was also comfortable with the people I was working with and the, the company. I knew how things were working and, and I wish I had uh, put myself in the situation I'm in today where I joined a, an industry that I, I know nothing about right. uh, with people that I don't know at all. And I tell you, I feel rejuvenated um, and mm. I wish I'd done that before. Yeah, and, and that's exactly why I wanted to ask because I think that is just a golden advice for people listening, understanding the importance of stretching yourself, you know, relatively frequently and, and not staying in that comfort zone across whether it no matter if it's work or something else. Um thank you for that, Fred. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So I mean, Fred, it's been a, a an insight packed uh, episode for for our our listeners. And in terms of how we typically wrap up our interview episodes, we have a quick fire five rounds of questions. Um, and we like to try and condense the answer down as as short as possible. So it's really everything that's top of mind with the with the questions that come well, up. I can't, so, I can't do short. <laughs> 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 to be honest, that's 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 more for my co-hosts because they like to jump in and, and give their valuable perspective as well so fred you can Sounds speak good. as long as you want we'll make an exception this time no problem um but fred so the first question um what is the worst piece of advice that you've ever received uh be choiceful with the uh, how much time you give to uh, to young talent i was uh when i uh, just to explain a bit context uh, when i uh became global CFO for one of the divisions. Uh, somebody told me, hey, you're now going to have to be choiceful. You can't be mentoring so many people. You can't be um, um, uh, just saying yes to any request to meet and so on. Um, I think that was the worst advice I've ever received because if there's, um, there's no better way to learn about how things are going in your business uh, to actually yeah, uh, contribute to developing talent that are going to make your business better and so on. I think that was by far the worst advice I've ever received. And I have to uh, thank you for ignoring that advice, Fred, because as exactly. you already said earlier, <laughs> earlier in the episode, Pabilo, Pabilo and I have benefited in our careers. And I think Daniel and Olu and our listeners will also benefit from uh, from this episode as well. So thank you for ignoring Absolutely. that advice on behalf yeah, of everyone. Yeah, it's true. Um, uh, the second question, uh, Fred, is, which is, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever received? It's, it's actually linked. Uh, and the best piece of advice was uh, manage your energy, not your time. And so I don't count the time I give to uh, people, but I manage my energy. And so if I'm not in the right uh, energy level to be able to contribute to a mentoring conversation, for example, or um, to a, a, a meeting with my wife, <laughs> then uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, I try to, uh, to deal with the energy side of things. Yeah. I like that. Just to double, double click on that, Fred, for the, mm -hmm. for the listeners who are in a relationship or, or married or have kids? How do you get your energy up before those important meetings with your wife? <laughs> no, and, and, and even any meeting, right? Uh, um, one thing that I, I learned um, was how to leverage transitions between meetings, uh, between yeah. work and home and so on, to put yourself in the right mindset. It's amazing how when you visualize uh, things and uh, think about what you want to get out of the next interaction right uh how these things actually become reality so managing transitions was the best learning for me um uh, back in spain i was known for um uh, having uh walking meetings uh to kind of sh of, of uh, change up things and having uh breaks between meetings to kind of um uh, clear up my mind about prior meeting get ready for the next one set your intentions so I think that's that's the the one thing that helped me most uh, managing my energy going into a meeting versus just uh, trying to manage my calendar and and time. Super practical for for our listeners, Fred. So thanks for for sharing. So the next question, which is the third question of our final five, it's what is a piece of content that you're loving at the moment? It can be a book, digital media, movie, whatever you like. Oh, I could mention a few. Uh... The Take Flight uh, podcast, uh, <laughs> for sure, but that's a given. But maybe uh, if 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 I if I had to mention something else, I would say you know in a in a world where everything is bad news, uh, AI is going to take over the world. You're going to lose your job, um, and so on. I think uh, for me, there's a, a newsletter that I've been uh, reading for a couple of years now. That is called Not Boring. Uh, by a guy called uh, Paki McCormick. And it's, uh, the subtitle is A Weekly Dose of Optimism. Uh, I think it's uh, one 
technology or one business at a time or something like this. So he, he talks about how uh, people are kind of trying, are optimists about the future and kind of changing the, trying to change the world. I really recommend that for everybody that w doesn't want to get depressed by the, uh, the main channel news. Great recommendation, Fred. And I think especially this year where it's an election year in multiple countries and uh, viral things going online that are maybe trying to get you more reactive, then this would definitely be something that we should all sign up to. So just to repeat for, for our listeners, it's called the Not Boring Newsletter. So that's an easy one to remember as well. And obviously we can't forget that Fred's first answer was Take Flight Podcast. So we'll remember that as well. <laughs> um, penultimate question, Fred. Uh, something that you're curious to learn more about at the moment? Um... So yeah, obvious one, but you know, I, I invested quite a bit of time building up uh, uh, teams around artificial intelligence. And I think we're at a, at a time now that it's going to be pivotal. Uh, and I think what interests me is in particular, how are we going to do uh, rescaling of our um, um, employees and, and workforce? Uh, because we never had to do it at this speed before. If you look at all of the other technological innovations that came through the professional world. Um, and so I'm, I'm not necessarily AI, I'm really more interested in, hey, what about the, the, the capabilities and people side of it? Perfect. And Fred, to, to close out our final five questions, what does take flight mean to you? Mm. Mm. I, I love the, the, the name of the podcast. Uh, I mean, for me, it's uh, when I hear this, I, I immediately think uh, confidence and courage at the same time. Confidence and courage. Love it. I Fred, love thank you so much for, for the time. I think we'll pass it over to, to Daniel to help uh, wrap up the, the episode. But on behalf of us all, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. I was going to say before closing, if there was any links or um, <laughs> any links people could connect uh, connect with you on, but I don't want to inundate your LinkedIn uh, in <laughs> <laughs> But if you find Fred, you find Fred. But no, thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you, Fred. Um, as I will say in, uh, in Port Portuguese, obrigado, senhor, or French, obrigado. monsieur. Um, so thank you for this wonderful episode, Fred. And for all of our listeners, we hope you found this episode very insightful, very impactful, and can help you take you to the next level in your professional and academic career. Until next time, stay safe and God bless. And find us on Instagram at Take Flight Podcast, as well as YouTube and TikTok with the same handle. Take off, take flight with you. We never fly away